kick-ass switch, putting the K in magic. I'm Joanna DeVoe, and you're watching another episode of Every Which Way, this time featuring Fiona Benjamin, former card slinger, current kick-ass biz witch. Fiona, you may actually probably, I'm guessing you know who Fiona is. She was a really popular tarot reader in the online witchy community and this year she transitioned her business so that she's doing more of a supportive role like a behind the scenes role in other people's businesses a lot of those people are tarot card readers and she's a virtual assistant now so this is going to be a really interesting video for those of you that are biz witches but also we really get into talking about the lifestyle, how do you design a lifestyle around being a stay-at-home parent and running your own business? She also happens to be Chinese. She is uniquely witchy in a very specifically Chinese kind of way that I find totally fascinating. You have to stick around to, this, to the end of this video when she talks about something I feel like it's called Ghost Day. I forgot the name of it already. <laughs> it reminds me of like a Chinese Samhain. It's super interesting. Uh, so enjoy this interview with a really unique kick-ass witch, Fiona Benjamin. Hi, Fiona. Welcome to Every Witch Way. Hi. Hi. I'm so excited to talk to you face to face. We've like tweeted back and forth, but we've never had yeah, an we actual conversation. For a while. <laughs> Yeah, and I thought it was so funny, not too long ago, I think one of your Facebook ads or videos somehow ended up on my husband's news feed, and he, like, he unfollowed, he unfollowed me for a while, because he's like, too much magic, too much, too much of all that, and I don't know how you somehow ended up on it, but he actually sat there and watched it, he was like, you know, this actually isn't bad, you are the first person that, like, my husband hasn't, like, I don't know, just rolled his eyes at <laughs> tell him thank you <laughs> I think it's because I walk between the worlds you know I can be very mm -hmm. new agey I love the witch stuff I know what you're doing now is very much you're a biz witch although what you're yeah. doing is not magical per se although I'm mm -hmm. guessing knowing that you are such a magical person that it has something to do with the behind the scenes of yeah in your business um <laughs> But I know, too, you have a very, very unique history. Do you call yourself a witch? Um, I do, kind of. But I also, uh, I guess, like, this can go branch into, like, a whole different tangent. But I also, I tell people, well, I'm Chinese, and this is what Chinese people do. Yes. That's <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. That's why I'm asking, I'm like, do, are you even a witch? I don't know. I know you have a very unique, to me, mm -hmm. At least, maybe in America, you have a unique witchy background, magical background. Yeah, and I think it? that's huge, like to bring up because I, I'm a first generation here in the U.S., so I feel like my upbringing was very, very Chinese, very Eastern. But then, like, I went to, I went to school in America. Like, I went to school with all different kinds of kids with all different backgrounds. So when I when I speak to someone who is Asian and they have a more um, Eastern upbringing, they're like, no, you're just Chinese, whatever. But then like when I'm talking to people who are on the Western side and had that Western upbringing, it's like, are you a witch? Yeah, sure. I guess you can you can call it that. Yeah, it's become such a broad term. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. But can you tell us a little bit about your Chinese magic or is it a religion? What is it? Tell us about it. Um, I think it's more, I think it's like everything because, um, growing up, it was more of a, it was more of a lifestyle. There wasn't a separation at all. It's almost like everything we did was magic. As an outsider looking in, you might say like, oh, well, a lot of it's superstition, but my parents were heavily, especially my mom, heavily, heavily Chinese Buddhist, which is really not what you see in the Western world. Like it's, it's very different. And a lot of it is also folk magic so it got like integrated and it became this like Chinese Buddhism so growing up like everything everything had magic everything had a spirit in it and the way you like the way you speak to someone the way you speak to even an object or an animal all of that was magic there really was no separation and I tell a story sometimes my mom got really mad at me when I was younger because when I threw tantrums 
I I wouldn't just sit there and like yell and scream at her. I would say things that I knew would kind of strike a chord with her. Like I would say something, we, we had a, a pet fish and I told her that it looked delicious. And we didn't say things about, say those things about pets because they would die if that happened. Because then the pet would think, oh, well, we're food. We're not a pet. So I'm going to die so you can eat me. So I used to say these things as a child. I was this god awful toddler. <laughs> and my mom would be like, no, you're cursing the animals. You're cursing our pets. So I feel like that's the type of upbringing I had. Everything was magic. Everything was very strongly integrated together, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it sounds very magical to me. And it's, it's animism, yeah? Um, I feel like everything is animism. Like, at the root of it, almost everything is animism. Do you think that, really? Like, how is Christianity animism? Like, how do you, how do you um, do that? No, I haven't really had a huge Christian. I went to church for, like, two years because I was very interested in it. My mom thought I was, like, crazy. She was, am I allowed to curse on this show? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My mom was just like, you're batshit crazy. Like, why would you go to church? So I actually ended up going to church, but I do feel like there, there is a little bit of animism, like like the blood of Christ, like the, that it has the ability to cleanse you. Like, I feel like that's great. Like, the fact that his flesh has the ability to, like, give, give you life. I don't know. I feel like mm. that's awesome. That's magical. interesting, yes. Somewhere my mother is like feeling you and being like, what's going on? <laughs> 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 um, I think animism is fascinating. For a long time, I just classified myself as a pantheist. Mm -hmm. But in the last year or so, I've just been thinking a lot about animism. I felt like as a child, I was naturally that way. Like I couldn't throw a stuffed animal away because... I, I knew that it was alive and I would see it like huh. looking at me in the trash. I just couldn't handle it. Like little things like that. And looking mm -hmm. back, I'm like, I, maybe they were alive. I don't know. My kids are like that. Like my son is like, he collects these rocks and they all have names and they all have like, they're almost catty and clicky. Some rocks need to sit next to this other rock because they don't like another rock. And he'll tell me these stories about these rocks. And it's like, you're three years old. Like, how do you know? How do you know how to be catty and bitchy with rocks? Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it must, there's got to be something. Do you feel like you're, are you passing the traditions that you were raised in down to your kids? I feel like, yes. Like, I have certain um, daily practices that my older son, actually, he, he loves helping me with. Like, we, every morning, we put incense in front of, if, like, if anyone's watched Mulan, that's pretty legit. Like, every morning, you wake up, you tend the ancestors, you put some incense out there. My son loves doing that every morning, and he will actually cry if I do it without him. Like, if he wakes up late, and I do it earlier, he will freak out. He needs to do it. It's his thing. How old is he? Uh, he's three. Oh, the oldest is three. Okay. Yeah. And then you My younger two. one's one. One. Yeah. You're a busy working mom. I, I will get to that, but I actually want to circle mm -hmm. back on what do you mean honoring the ancestors every morning? Like every morning, uh, what are you doing? Can you get specific about that? Or is yeah, that too I can I can get specific. And, and normally that's why I always reference like Mulan. Like if you've watched that, it's like, you know, you wake them up. You're like, here you go. You can, for me, I will sometimes give them like an elaborate meal if there's like a holiday or um, if it's like a Chinese festival coming up I'll give them a more elaborate meal but I try to like they love they love drinking so I try to give them something to drink in the morning for the alcoholic of course or water um or like little snacks like I know Chinese people love eating soda crackers with coffee I don't know I'm not into it but <laughs> I always saw my grandma doing that so I would give give them soda crackers so what just little do, tiny things what that. do you do at the end of the day like Oh, the end of the day, um, everything gets like cleaned out or if, there, if there's any candles going, I blow them out. I actually don't do candles because I have a cat and she sticks her tail in the fire all the time. And so it's like, yeah, you know, let's not do that. And of course, the little kids might get to, ooh, the fire, let me play with that. Yeah. So I actually use LED candles, which is totally appropriate in Buddhism. Like uh, people always tell me like, what? LED candles like doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of like a flame and like a spirit and energy and I was like no LED LED candles totally emit energy <laughs> so and it's keeping my family alive which is 
good. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, witchcraft doesn't have to be like, let me let me be dangerous and, you know, yeah. burn everything down. Yeah, you can, you can kind of, I don't want to say like update it a little bit, but our world is different from the way it was like 200 years ago. So we're going to honor a little bit differently. It, I mean, it's so different. Just look at your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is not even possible for someone even, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, if they're extremely clever and ambitious, mm -hmm. but um, you are a mompreneur, you have mm -hmm. two little, little ones, and you're running your own business, so how does magic serve that? Like, how, are, are you using magic to get, you know, to get it done, or is, are these, um, your spiritual world and your business world two totally different things? I, it's all it's all kind of together. Am I allowed to plug a book that I've read? Can I do that? Of course. Yes. Okay. Are you kidding? Like, I am such a booker. <laughs> Great. Yes. I just want to make sure. So my favorite book when people ask about entrepreneurship and, like, working and stuff like that is um, Jason Miller's Financial Sorcery. Oh, I have it. I love that book. And I actually um, – I'm a type of person, if I invest any money or time into a person or a thing, even a book – I will read like every single page and then put it into use. And that man is such a genius. And I will always recommend that book to anybody that wants to like start their own business or be an entrepreneur or make money. I've actually used a lot of his techniques, a lot of some of his um, sigils and things like, and it works. It works. Like he had one, um, it was for marketing. It was so the right people are put in front of your business. You know, because you don't, you know, if I'm running a business for, I don't know, dog lovers, you don't want to target shark lovers, I guess, something like that. So he, that sigil got the right people in front of my business. And I put on my business card, I had it on my website for a while, and it works. Like, whatever he's doing, he's doing it right. Yeah, that's my favorite part of the book. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so awesome. You can put it on candles, you can put it on on anything and I love it because it bridges this whole um 2016 like field of magic the fact that I could put a sigil on my website like that's modern day magic like that's badass for sure I recently saw someone doing emoji magic like I I do this little witch awesome. review but yeah it was like emoji spells <laughs> mm -hmm. and that has become our language it's almost like modern yeah. day hi uh, hieroglyphs so I was just like I, I think that makes sense to me I think I totally get that oh another one I love is mantras for your password like um that is I forgot who told me to do that but I love it because every time you enter in your password, it's almost like you're working the spell. Um, like if you have a password to your bank account, you know, you can put like, you can write, make your password like, you know, money stay with me, you know, like 777 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Denise Steffield Thomas talks about that sometimes. Yeah, does she? Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. Those are both good tips. Um, so how did you go, a lot of us know you as being a card slinger, you were mm -hmm. a tarot reader. Um, mm -hmm. I read something on your about page that I wanted to ask you about too mm -hmm. this morning because uh, you said something about not wanting to be a public figure anymore and step yeah. be in a support situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why? We love you. <laughs> I yeah. think you're such a great personality, you know, like you're someone that we really connect to. So I guess it's a two part question. Why did you make that leap? Mm -hmm. And then also, are you coming back to us? Like, will you be making, will you be putting yourself forward at some point? Um, I think with, with tarot, it, it started out, um, I was, I was in Japan and I was, a, I was a lot of money in debt for like, because I was, um, I was in college. So I was like a lot in debt and I just had a baby. I just moved across the world to be with my husband who's, who's a Marine in Japan. So he was like, you should probably get a job. And here I am. I'm like, I don't really have any life. I was a criminal justice major. So I was like, I don't have any life skills. You need a master's degree to get a job here. So I was like, I know how to read tarot. Let me, let me start up a business like reading tarot. And I really honestly did not expect it to, to blow up. I wasn't expecting to get popular. It wasn't like, you know, like, oh, you know, one day I'm going to build this giant tarot empire. It just, it kind of, it kind of happened. 
And for me, it was a lot to take on. And on one side, yes, being a public figure was nice because I got to connect with so many amazing people. There will always be people that, you know, don't like me. You probably have people that might not like your brand. And that's okay because for every one of those people, there's like nine people who love you. And that is where, that's what made me really happy, being able to connect to those people. On the other hand, my husband is in the military and he always told me, you have to be very careful with how you put yourself out there because, you know, at the same time, we're, we're still fighting a war. We're still, you have to be very careful about security. You have to be careful for our children. You have to be careful for me. And that that's a lot, like to hear him say that, to hear him tell me that I, I almost felt like, oh, you don't want me to do tarot anymore. You know, I almost like attacked him back like, this is my life. This is something I built up and you don't want me to do it anymore. But it does get taxing emotionally. And um, what kind of what kind of really did it for me was this year I decided I'm I'm going to go all out. You know, we're moving back to the state. So I'm going to do whatever I can and see, you know, where my business goes and actually blew up. It did. It did really well. But it was a lot of emails. It was a lot of messages on my Twitter, on my Facebook, and I couldn't handle it anymore. And I felt like I, my body was starting to break down. And I also just gave birth to my second son. And it's a lot to take all of that on at once. And I think I wrote a newsletter about this, but I think what it was like is holding on to like that old toy that you love, that you grew up with, and you just can't let it go. It's like, you know, it's like a pair of ballet slippers. It's like, oh, these are my first pair. You know, they're all worn. It's cutting into my toes and it's hurt, hurting me. But I just can't let them go because it was that first love. And I feel like that's how tarot was for me as a business. I still read my cards like every day. I still practice it almost every day. But like doing it publicly, it, it was so taxing on like my soul. Yeah. So... Yeah, it was it was a lot. But to kind of answer whether or not like I'll come back, I'm actually really happy doing what I'm doing now. I'm supporting other business owners. Um, Some of them are actually tarot readers. I'm working behind the scenes to help them with the tech portion that they're not necessarily good at. So the idea behind that is you're good at what you're doing. Like as a tarot reader, you're good at, you know, helping people, coaching people but you might not necessarily be good at um, taking care of your inbox or taking care of your website because your website goes down and you need help. So I kind of stand there in a support role. When you can't be there, I'll be there to help you with the tech stuff. And I'm very happy doing that. So I think I'm going to be here for a while. Yeah, I saw you have packages that are like, I think this is right, eight hours a month. Yeah. And how does that work? If um, Like, how much can you get done in eight hours? And, and how do you, you know, I don't know. I'm just curious about how that mm-hmm. part of it works. Um, um, I actually get a, a lot done in eight hours because um, when I was building my tarot business, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I had to learn how to do all the, how to set up a newsletter, how to, you know, upload things on YouTube, how to cut videos and do editing. I had to do all of that for myself. So I'm normally working with people that are in that stage of where I was, where they're Googling how to do this, trying to figure out how to upload a blog post. Oh, my God, this image is not centered and I can't figure out, you know, what the code is to fix it. So because I already know all of this, I can go in and do in maybe like five minutes what would take you an hour to Google and figure out. So people normally tell me like, holy crap, like you're done already. Like that only took you an hour. That usually takes me like two days. I'm like, yeah. We're done. <laughs> that is so cool. So they can like spread out their eight hours over mm-hmm. the course of it's, the it's month by month. So normally some people have like a huge launch coming up and we'll use up all eight hours in like two days because I'm doing a lot of work on the back end. And then sometimes people will be like, oh, well, I just need like maintenance here and there. So two hours a week. Yeah. I'm wondering if what you did as a tarot reader just built up that trust because as a business owner, I have not hired anyone yet mm-hmm. and I definitely will have to, I should have already. <laughs> I'm insanely yeah. busy. Um, but for me, a big part of it is trust, like letting someone mm-hmm. into my business, letting them into my inbox, letting them into my space is just, mm-hmm. how, how do you build that trust with a potential client? Mm-hmm. 
yeah, that's definitely like a huge question. It's something that I, I get a lot. Like, I don't know. Um, cause right now I am, I'm booked out for like the next six months. So I do have a lot of other assistants asking me, well, this client doesn't really trust me. And they'll ask me to do things like, I want you to record your screen as you're working. And that's kind of like, oh, eh, there goes my privacy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when it comes to that, I think showing them what, what you can do and how you talk to them is important. And I feel like this, I learned this from being a tarot reader. As a tarot reader, we kind of use a lot of jargon sometimes. Like, we'll say things like, um, you know, your soul's calling, and we'll say things like um, intuition, but a customer doesn't understand what those words mean. It's like they live in a completely different world. So when you say those words, they don't understand it, and you kind of miss them, and they don't really trust you because it feels like, well, they're using very, very fluffy, almost like out there words that, I cannot relate to and it's the same thing when you're trying to help someone with their business and um, like on my sales page I will literally tell somebody I will set up your newsletters and your sequences for you so you can go take a nap today that's that's exactly what I do like I don't use any fancy language um, look for someone who honestly speaks your language look for someone who you know it's like hey you know you are owning a you own, a, you own a soul-centered business, you know, you do your thing and I'll take care of your customer support, you know, then you know they speak your language. <laughs> Have you ever thought about like scaling up and representing other VAs or uh, teaching people how to be, um, I should say virtual assistant because I don't know that mm -hmm. everybody knows what I'm saying. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, or are you just very content, you know, you have your clients and you feel like you've really set it up for yourself in a way that works with your family life? Um, right now, I actually have two interns that they're doing a paid internship, and my cat is my cat is broken. <laughs> uh, they're actually doing a paid internship with me, and um, I teach them a lot of the technology that they they don't know how to use, but is in high demand right now. So, and I also um, now that I'm booked out, I actually hand them a lot of clients that come my way. Um, do I necessarily want to scale doing that? I don't think so because I don't want to head back into that public figure territory. I, it, I've only had a break since like August and I'm like, I'm not really ready to like put myself out there and be like, ah, soar me with emails and requests. But, um, on the, on like the low key. Yeah. I'm helping other VAs build their business because I think we, we could use more VAs out there. We need more assistance. We need more nap time. Yeah, nap time. Well, you're a mom, so we should talk yeah. about parents that are running their own businesses from home. I am one. Um, my son has autism, so he's an adult now, but we're in this for life. Like, I will always be a parent who works from home. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear, like, a young mom talking about things and me completely relating to it because I'm still, mm -hmm. I'm still in it, you know? Give me one second. My dog also broke it. She's trying to eat my cat. <laughs> Human babies and fur babies. <laughs> yeah, I actually have, my dog is only six months old, so. <laughs> what kind of dog? It's a beagle and chihuahua, so you can kind of imagine what that bark sounds like. I can imagine the energy level is probably like, woo! Yeah, but um, my kids actually wear that puppy out. Oh, really? <laughs> Because my kid's energy level is pretty out there. Do either of your kids have, like, what you had, like, yet? I guess it hasn't probably emerged yet for the one-year-old, but has the three-year-old started showing signs of wanting to, like, mess with your head like you did with your mom with the fish? <laughs> well, he actually really likes cards. And um, I, I went to a convention around and George actually gave me um, her Letterman deck, and I gave it to my son. And he's actually been card slinging. So hopefully he doesn't mess with me in the way I'm, I was such a terrible child. <laughs> I really hope like he doesn't mess with me the way I mess with my parents. Mm. And if he does, like, I think, I think I can, I can put him in his place a little bit. <laughs> I'm two steps ahead of you, kid. <laughs> yeah. I did it first. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're, you're playing the game, but I invented it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So right as I'm asking you about having a family and running yeah. a business, the animals bust in. So that was yeah. actually really appropriate. So how do you juggle what you do? How do you blend those two parts of your life? 
So I'm actually really good at automating everything in my life. Like every, well, I guess not everything in my life, more so in my business. Like in order to, um, in order to work with me as a virtual assistant, I send you through this process where um, you have to fill out a form and that form triggers a email that asks you to schedule a call with me. And then it, and then we hop on a call together. And if that call works out, I have this workflow that I have set up on a program called 17 Hats. I literally click a button and everything is automatic. A contract gets sent out to you, an invoice that gets sent out to you, a welcome email, a how to contact me email, like everything just happens. So in this age of technology, like we as witches have to take advantage of technology. I don't know, are tech witches a thing? Can, I don't can we... know. I feel like there's a weird fine line. There's a book out called Magic and Loss that I'm interested in. It's about the internet. Mm-hmm. I don't know why she used the word magic. Mm-hmm. But what interests me is she did use the word magic in the title. And it's about the internet. And I think how it's like, mm-hmm. changing us. And I feel like there's a lot of magic going on. The way that I'm just talking to you right now. Is yeah. something that if, you know, someone 100 years from, you know, the past could just have a peek into my living room right now, they'd be like, it's <laughs> evil! Oh my god! What are they doing? You know, like, yeah. who is this, like disembodied head talking through this weird <laughs> flat thing you know it's just like um mm-hmm. there's so many magical components to it energetically like the election we just went through and oh, the yeah. way that that strangers were shaping some people's day people that couldn't protect themselves or didn't know mm-hmm. how i think there's a lot of magic going on right now online yeah there's a lot of potential and I'm very eager, especially um, for the next generation. I'm very eager to see like what they do with magic and technology together because um, and maybe because I'm in a bubble. I feel like a lot of us are becoming entrepreneurs. A lot of us are staying away from what maybe our grandparents did where, you know, you work that nine to five job, you work under someone else, you work your way up. I feel like a lot of us are breaking away from that starting our own businesses, starting our own blogs, like we connect through blogs, social media, websites, there's so much potential for magic to be done there. And I am really like, I want to see what the next generation brings. Like, I'm really excited to see where this goes. Yeah, it's like that emoji spell that I just saw. Yeah, like your my first reaction is that's ridiculous. And then like, a second later, my next reaction is it's awesome. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I get that. You know, at first, it just seems like I know there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, not great feelings around the blending of pop culture and magic right now. But mm-hmm. I think I'm a go with the flow kind of person. And I think it's really fascinating and interesting to see that yeah. they're like mixing like that. I also think your words are your wands in a way. So the internet's creative potential that way is uncharted like we don't even know like we're just getting started right now yeah and I know for me like the way I verbally told my mom like oh our fish looks delicious you know our fish is gonna die tomorrow um I feel like words also have an impact over the internet the words you say to people the word like when you're texting someone sometimes like I'll write something like on Twitter that I like I'll see something I disagree with and then I'll write something on Twitter and I'll have to like take a step back and be like do I really want to say this like you know do I really want to hurl this kind of energy at this person no I don't want you know they might get sick you know they might it might at the very least their feelings might get hurt and your feelings are intimately tied to your energy so in a way it is it is still magic so even in what you type, what you what you send to other people, there is energy and magic behind it. And I know some people will be like, oh, well, you know, that's super new age and that's a bit of a stretch. But I personally don't believe there is much separation between pop culture and magic, um, the Internet and magic. Magic finds its way into everything. There's no escape. You can't contain it. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> I think it, I think the internet has amplified it too. Like you know, yeah. you're saying about writing something, if you put it on the internet, it's not just your words going through the air to one person mm-hmm. in one room. For one, they're sticking, they're staying up unless you delete the post. Um, but also other people are seeing it. So it's, 
I believe magic just generally works like this, that you're not just affecting one person, that you're actually creating a kind of energy bubble around, mm -hmm. you know, it can go far and wide and it can reach around corners and do all kinds of interesting stuff, but it's affecting you primarily. I feel like what you put out is like, yeah affecting you and i think the internet just amps that up so much and then talking about texting and emojis too i think we had to have this language because you can text someone something perfectly benign like you mean it in the mm -hmm. nicest way and they receive it as like what a bitch why did she say that to me and because yeah. it's just so dry so we had to start being like happy face unicorn sparkles and hearts to let you know because you can't read people's facial expressions and you know what that i find that women do that a lot more because i don't know where i read this on the internet that when women use like periods in their sentences I it's very it. like it, it's almost like doing this to someone it's almost like putting your hand in their face so women have to like compensate by using a lot of exclamation points and emojis yep. but men don't have to do that so that's also that's also like an interesting like thing to so it's like you know if a woman puts like a period at the end of the sentence and they're sending that out like it's the energy you're receiving what you're intending and that's also part of magic and um it's like it's a spell you're doing and the outcome is it what you intended so you know again magic all Twist together. Absolutely. I saw that article. It, I I feel like maybe it was on Man Repeller. I don't remember, but it was really good. Yeah. <laughs> it actually made me feel better about the emojis and the all caps and the exclamation yeah. points because I, I can be such a clown, like just in yeah. general anyway, but that was making me feel very clown-like and something about that article shifted my perspective a little bit. It's like, well, that's, that's how women communicate with each other. Yeah. And that's the language, you know, and mm -hmm. that's the language. If you don't want to lose all your friends because <laughs> they, <think, laughs> they think you're being a jerk face, you might want to put a happy face on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Emoji magic. I'm going to, I'm waiting for that book to come out. If that, if that person ever writes a book, I will buy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That would be really interesting, right? Uh mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you too about structure. I'm a big structure nut and you're talking about automation and I know that that is like, that is hardcore structure, but how do you structure your day? Do you have like, I work this many hours or are mm -hmm. you like, oh, the kids are hungry. I'll take a couple hours off and go back. Like, do you find your work is bleeding into your sleep time or your TV time or whatever it is that you enjoy? <laughs> um, so, you know, I do have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so I can't structure my day as well <laughs> as I would like to. But um, generally, I find that um, the best way for me to get, get shit done is to put my phone down and to not be on, like, social. I actually cut back on so much social media because um, this sounds so silly, like, looking back my dishes weren't getting done. My dishes were piling up in the sink. My husband would come home from work after 12 hours at work and he'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, are you serious? We have a dishwasher. Put him in the dishwasher. And I'm just like, I don't have time to get it done. So I actually use the, I think that technique where you do things for 25 minutes yeah. and then you break for five. I actually tried that technique for 25 minutes. I put my phone down, did not go on Facebook, Twitter, nothing. And I got my dishes done in 10 minutes because of that. So I think when it comes to structuring my day, there's always time. And I always hear this quote flying on the internet. You have the same amount of hours in a day as Beyonce and Beyonce can get it done. So, so can you, you just have to really maximize every second that you have and me saying that almost sounds exhausting but then I think about how much time did I waste today sitting on Twitter you know just scrolling how much time did I waste today on Facebook how much time did I waste today laying in my bed because I didn't want to get up so I really gotta you know find find where my priorities are and on the other hand um, with finding your priorities what don't you prioritize get rid of that like, for me, I know I try to read a little bit every night, but it became a chore. So I was like, I really don't need this. I don't need to read. I'm not in school anymore. I love to read. I don't need it anymore. I just cut those things out of your life. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Did I go on tangent? No, I love, I'm a, 
that's how I speak. I speak, okay. I speak in tangent and typo. So, <laughs> okay. um, I think too, you just kind of plugged your business because when you were talking about Beyonce, mm -hmm. I kind of don't love that quote because Beyonce mm -hmm. has an amazing team of people Yeah, and her life is really about doing what she wants to do. And, mm -hmm. and there are people doing all this other stuff that makes it happen. Yeah. And your website says something about like delegate, like it's one of the main things. Oh yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah, so that's something important to mention to people. I don't think having an online business is for mm -hmm. everyone. Um, oh I, no. I do biz witch coaching and I can tell immediately when this is not for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like certain people, it's just, it's only for a certain kind of person. And even within that, I think, you might think you're that kind of person and then a year three years five years later you find out you're not but and you I'm, know what maybe maybe they're not ready for it and i i always tell people like maybe it's just not a good time in your life to start a business because sometimes people tell me like you know i'm struggling with a breakup right now and they're using starting a business as a almost like a way to not think about it. Mm -hmm. And I and I feel like sometimes, you know, just be in the present, deal with what's going on now. And when you feel like, hey, you know, I'm ready to, it's a commitment. It's like being, it's like getting married. It's like you wouldn't just get married, like, to someone you just met. It's like if you want to really take on a a business, um, be, be in a place where you're like, okay, I'm sure. I'm going to take this plunge. I'm going to take this risk because that's a commitment yeah. for a while. Yeah, well, how does delegating factor in? Like, when do you think it's time to start delegating? Is that something people should do right away? Or, like, is there, like, this magical moment when you're like, and mm -hmm. now it is time to begin delegating these shitty tasks that I'm doing? <laughs> and I feel like, you know, kind of back to that Beyonce quote, Beyonce wasn't always where she's at now. At some point, she was hustling, too, you know? She oh, was oh, trying to... I can't. No, she had yeah. her dad and and her mom but and she her... still has to put in the work yes, she still yes. has to put in but the she work you can't a support structure i have to say like she's maybe the most talented person on the planet but then again like when i think about it when people tell me they're starting their own business they're like and they have kids their mom or their or their dad might be watching their kid you know they might have a sister you know who's watching their kid so you know everybody's got a little something so i that's why i'm still standing by that quote anyway <laughs> But with, when it comes to delegating, when you start out, um, you don't want to delegate right away. You don't want to spend money that you don't have um, because, you know, what's the point of having a business if it's not bringing in money? I know for me, um, my when I first started delegating, it wasn't even like, oh, let me hire an assistant. It was, I need freaking childcare. So um, I, that was my first purchase the first thing I outsourced was I found a nanny that worked in my budget and there was a very very nice lady in Okinawa um, she was also a military wife and she told me he, she was like I'm not looking to start a business I just want to make some extra cash on the side so if you'll give me a hundred dollars per week I'll watch your kid and I was like okay and she watched like she would come over she watched my kid I paid her a hundred dollars that's like three tarot readings back then for me so I knew my job was to have at least three tarot readings every week so I could pay her. And that almost kept me accountable. Like, you can't fuck around anymore. Now now you are owning a business because you have someone else that depends on the money you're making. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you should start delegating when, A, you, you have the money to delegate or it's in your financial plan to delegate in the future. And two, when you can identify what it is in your business that is causing you some sort of stress or that you just can't handle it anymore because an issue I've also seen is that people automatically try to get an assistant and then just dump their whole business on their assistant and their assistant's like I don't know what to do and I've talked to some people that have had that happen to them so and you want to start small you don't want to delegate everything if you want to start with your inbox that's a great place to start another one is um, I tell people just write their blog posts on a word document email it to me, close your computer, and just leave. And I will take care of all the uploading, creating social media graphics, uploading it to their Twitter, their Facebook. That's something that can also be delegated to an assistant. Good to know. I imagine good communication is so important there too as well. Mm -hmm. 
And I think your tip to not start out delegating, I think even if you do have a budget for some reason in the beginning yeah. for that, that it is good to know how your business works. Um, yeah. You know, and to you can't tell someone, someone else what you want them to do if you don't know how to do it yourself. Yeah. That's how I think about it. Like, you can't tell someone, hey, I need you to um, put, like, my blog post up. And then they're looking at you like, where's your blog? I don't know. Just put it up somewhere. Like, make it happen. Like, you should probably know your business before you hand over your business to someone else. Yeah. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are control freaks and that a lot of us oh, yeah. get into business because we want to control our own destiny and all of that. So that, then it becomes about kind of what I was saying before, <laughs> letting go of some of that control because you, you do learn all the different parts. Mm -hmm. um, when you were a tarot reader, like, mm -hmm. did you actually enjoy, you seem to really enjoy, like, the technical aspects of business. I did. <laughs> that is, I'm going to have to pass some business your way because most of the people that come to mm -hmm. me for biz coaching, they're really interested in, like, branding and, and yeah. shaping a business around their creativity. And mm -hmm. they're not so technologically inclined, neither am I. So uh, I have to remember you the next time someone's mm -hmm. like, but all this other stuff, you know. And I did do like some business coaching because that when I started fizzling with tarot, I was getting so burnt out. I had I was starting to get tarot readers coming to me and they're like, I don't want a reading. I just want to see the way you do your business. And I was like, what? So I was like, you know what? I'm going to charge for this. Yeah. I'm going to charge if you want to see how I do my business. And I would tell them, they would pick my brain, and then they would say, halfway through, some of them would just say, never mind, Fiona, can you just do it for me? I'm not learning MailChimp. I'm not learning YouTube. I'm not learning all of that. I don't have time. And um, and I've come to notice a lot of us, a, a lot of us witches or um, card readers, intuitives, like, have either like chronic pain or a reason why they can't be on the computer. It's not laziness. It's not like I don't want to learn it. It's you can't. You physically cannot sit there in front of a computer that long or they have kids and they physically cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think what I can do for you is I can create like a PDF file of like resources like, hey, if you want branding, go here. If you want, um, you know, someone to help you write your sales page, go here. And I could create like a resource list for your audience. Oh my gosh, are you saying to yeah. me right now? Yeah, like I can just put this together for you in like a PDF file. That would be and crazy. Yeah, That'd we can so have it like cool. down like as a link for people to click on like after they watch this. Yes, do it. That would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people would love that. So many tarot readers, so many healers. What you said about being in pain is yeah. um, true. Why do you think <laughs> that is? You know, I don't, I feel like maybe as human beings, like we are, most of us are in pain and whether, it doesn't have to be like a physical pain. Whereas I have met a lot of tarot readers who told me like, I have chronic illness, like this whole marketing thing is not going to work for me and I'm not going to put my body through that stress. And then there's also a lot of people out there that are like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going through something right now. Like I'm in therapy or I'm super sick with something or I feel like as human beings, a lot of us are in pain, but we don't like to acknowledge our pain because it's a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, and I see this on social media, especially on Facebook. Facebook's a terrible place to be in too, for too long. Where people just condemn others for speaking out about their pain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're watching this and you're in pain, you're, you're in good company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably a mix of everything you just said and also people that do healing work. They sometimes end up taking on energy that's not theirs. But I also think, too, if you have a lot of chronic pain, it's appealing to run your own business from home because then you aren't having to, like, adhere to someone else's schedule and get up and get out of the house. So I was just mm -hmm. interested in getting your take on that because I definitely noticed that for sure. And it could yeah. just be people in general. Like, we could all just be having this happen to us right now because of environmental issues and food issues and we're so busy like we're just the acceleration we're yes 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 and i definitely feel like when it comes to magic um because i used to do spells for my clients and my most popular spells were always love money or hurting another person like curses and for me nobody ever asked for protection 
And that was always very interesting to me. Like, people will ask, I want you to find me another lover, but they'll never ask me, I want you to protect my heart from being taken advantage of. I want protection from, you know, against, you know, being in a car accident so I don't have to pay another car bill. You know, I don't want, no one to ask me for protection against like financial woes or anything like that. And I feel like we take our health and we take um, cleansing and shielding and protection. We don't prioritize that until we are like, oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. And then we're like, what crystal can I hold? And I feel like it's a little bit more complicated than holding a crystal. It's, yeah, it's, you can't take a vitamin now. You should have took a vitamin before, (laughs) but you can't take a vitamin now. Now you need something a little, now you need to go to the ER. (laughs) (laughs) Hurry. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And that actually kind of brings me full circle to um, the tradition that you grew up in. and working with ancestors, why are you working with them? Like, is there a protection factor? Or are you just honoring them? Uh, what, mm-hmm. is, what is the reason behind it? Or is it just a tradition that goes on and on and nobody oh, knows why? No, in Chinese folklore, we believe, because um, again, it's integrated with Buddhism. So we believe in Nirvana. We re- and that's the goal, to reach a state of Nirvana. But um, if... If we're still here, you know, because um, the other belief is that our babies are our ancestors reincarnated. So my two sons are actually great, great, great grandma or grandpa somewhere. So um, you reincarnate to reach this um, this nirvana. So we're still birthing babies in this bloodline. We haven't reached that yet. But when you die, um, you have to almost, and this is almost Christian in a sense, you have to repent for things that you've done and if you've hurt other people um if you've gone against like buddhist teachings you you have to pay for it so you end up almost in like this underworld if you google like chinese hell it's like whoa okay. this is some like medieval <laughs> torture shit like it's pretty brutal so there's a and hell there's a hell i guess yeah and it's like i i guess i kind of call it the underworld and there's like a guy with like an ox's head and a guy with like a horse's head that like shepherds all you in there but and this is not very buddhist but it's hilarious i don't know i don't understand why you can bribe these guards and you can bribe your way through so the idea is when we honor our ancestors sometimes we burn paper money and that money is currency it's they're called hell notes <laughs> Oh, hell notes. I'm giving grandma hell notes. So glad I asked this. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, when you burn this money, it goes to your ancestors. And your ancestors can actually bribe these guards to kind of like look the other direction. And they can bribe their way through the underworld. And um, at the same time, they get hungry too. It's almost as if they're alive on the other side. So you feed them so they can eat. And sometimes we burn paper houses for them because when we burn that paper house they get a house in the underworld we burn like you can burn paper iphones for them. i don't know why my dead like great 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 grandfather needs an iphone but okay i will burn you a paper iphone if you want a paper iphone so you are nourishing their spirit um from the other side and you are helping strengthen their bodies like strengthen their spirits to move through this um underworld until they're ready to reincarnate if they're reached nirvana they don't even go through this place they just go into happy land and you know whatever they're happy but um they basically have to go through this underworld until they're ready to reincarnate so um that's how we take care of them and if you don't take care of them your ancestors are allowed to come and whoop your ass we have this we have a celebration it's usually around the around the summer And that's when we take care of other people's ancestors. The gates of the underworld are supposed to have opened and all these spirits come walk the earth. And we will have like, like in Chinatown, they'll have all these parades and they'll put food out. And like, it's just like a jolly good time. And the dead are walking among us. And what we also do is we feed the um, ancestors of other people who either don't care or have died and their ancestors are kind of stuck in limbo. That way the dead can't can't come back and fuck with us and mess with our lives and oh my you know. gosh that is so interesting <laughs> i'm gonna have to check out our chinatown this summer and see what's going on uh ask them for um when ghost month is and ghost month. you will, will see it yeah it's called ghost month 
and it is it's fantastic like the celebrations are awesome and there they'll be like giant there'll be pigs and like cooking and food and all this stuff just laid out all over the streets like in honor of the dead but you kind of do like a mini honor for your own. those are for other people's ancestors but every day you kind of want to give thanks to your own ancestors and also feed them and ask them if they need anything and if you need something from them you can feel free to be like hey grandma come help me out here yeah that's <laughs> that kids. was my next question or is this just a blanket the ancestors or do you have like grandma mabel grandpa joe like you have like and are you, I, mean, I do. You yeah, do. like I, but then there's also the ancestors where I have never met or I don't know, and I will have something separate for them. So like, I know, I know my grand, like my grandparents, because I met them when they were living, like I'll have a place for them. And then I'll kind of have offerings out for ancestors that I never really met, because they still need to be taken care of too. Mm. Is your husband Chinese? Oh no, he's super, he is so white that when I when we started dating, he was like, well, "What are you?" And I was like, "Well, I'm Chinese, Malaysian, American." And what are you? And he was like, "I'm white with like a drop of Cherokee." And I was like, "Oh, well, like what kind of white? Like, are you Irish? Are you, like, what are you?" And he's just like, "White, like, just white." A lot of us don't know. That's why yeah. I think we get so excited about like this yeah. year. I got really into my ancestry, but we are just. Like, we're just white American mutts. We don't even know. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to really do some digging to find out. What does he think about, you know, the rituals and the ancestors and all of that? Is that something he's embraced? Or is he just like, there's my wife doing her Chinese magic? <laughs> yeah. Well, he knew what he was getting into because um, before, like, our first date, we were on the phone. He actually asked me if I had a cauldron and the cloak hidden somewhere. And I thought he was being an asshole. He was totally serious. Like, he wanted to know, like, what my life was like. And um, he is okay with it because um, most people that walk into my house have no idea they've entered a witch's home until they, like, open the wrong cabinet <laughs> or something where they shift something over and see something hidden behind it. Um, I very much like to be discreet about what I – especially because I'm in the South right now. So I want to be discreet with how I'm working. So my husband likes that. As long as I'm discreet and as long as um, I'm not putting it out there in people's faces and, you know, trying to cause attention, he doesn't really mind. I'll ask him, hey, like, I need you to, like, we'll have a night, Sunday night, where I just make offerings for, like, two hours straight. And he'll help me. I'll be like, hey, can you put these apples? Can you bring these over here? Can you clean out, you know, grandma's um, cup and give her some more coffee? He'll help me with that, and then my son will help with that. So it's like a family affair. He digs oh, it. That's neat. Um, I can't believe I've talked to you for as long as I have. Let's wrap this <laughs> okay, up. Oh, okay, that was, I, was, I could talk to you for a long time. This is all so <laughs> interesting, Fiona. So interesting. Maybe because I am a white mutt. I don't know. But I'm just like, tell me more. <laughs> I've been trying to get my husband to get his DNA test, but I don't know. He's not, he's not interested. He, he very... Um, he embraces his, like, redneck heritage, I guess, as he calls it. Okay, all right. Well, I always I always end by asking people what their one tip is for creating the kick-ass life of their dreams. So I'll just leave that open-ended for you. You can answer it in any way you want. I think, like, to kind of create, like, the life that you want, and this is something I've learned this year, is to really set boundaries for yourself with, everything whether it's business family friends um don't be afraid to take some you time and and say no like if you feel like everything's too overwhelming it's time to say no like if you feel like you know my practice is not being respected by people that enter my home it's time to say sorry you're not welcome here anymore and i feel like learning to put down that boundary actually welcomes um peace into your life welcomes people who will appreciate you and it um it it makes life a lot more serene and zen <laughs> agreed agreed no is my favorite word right now <laughs> yeah it's like it's been that kind of a year <laughs> yeah it's a world builder too the more you say no to the more clear and specific you get when you're creating your own life it's about discernment yeah. and not taking it all in yeah, and you don't have to, and I feel like, especially people that are new in magic, they feel like they have to know everything, they feel like they have to research everything, 
And you don't. It's like, not even you just possible. To, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, first of all, it's not even possible. <laughs> and second of all, it's sometimes you, you just want to focus and place boundaries on, okay, I'm learning this right now. I'm going to say no to everything else coming my way because I don't want to, you know, take take away from what's in front of me right now. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I feel like boundaries definitely help even with magical practices. Thank you so much for saying yes to do this with me today, Fiona. I really Thanks for having it. me. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank much, you. Much love, everybody. Peace. Peace.